This is the April edition of Is This a Thing? with the theme, Wish You Were Here. And um, I am Susie Kahn Weinberg, your host for the evening. And somewhere in this vast array of faces are my co-producers, Damien Mischewski and Jake Cowan. All right, let's give them a big applause. So um, we come to you tonight via Zoom to do as we do each month, to come together and share stories and feel connected. And we wanna thank you in advance for your patience for any wonky tech issues that might come up, that will come up, that are probably already coming up. Um, we know our tolerance as a nation is pretty high for all this tech stuff that we've seen on TV these past few weeks. <laughs> and, and, but I'll tell you, SNL pretty much nailed it this weekend. It was very impressive, so check that out. Um, Y'all, it's been a month to the day that we have been sheltering in place here in Chicago. And we picked the theme, wish you were here back in January, having nothing to do with anything Corona or COVID or socially distant. It wasn't even an expression I'd ever heard before other than to describe a roommate I once had in college. <laughs> <laughs> um, and tonight we very much are not together at O'Shaughnessy's, our usual spot, which totally sucks. However, there's an upside to this web way of gathering we have friends and family joining us from different locations all over the country, perhaps all over the world if they wanna be up in the middle of the night. <laughs> so take that social distancing. And speaking of O'Shaughnessy's, I do wanna give them a shout out to say how much we miss them and to let you local Chicago folks know that they are doing takeout and delivery. So be sure to add O'Shaughnessy's to your takeout rotation. My family's up to two nights a week. I'm, I'm shooting for one more. <laughs> Um, okay, a few housekeeping things. We're asking that you all stay on mute for the entire show. Um, you might re realize that um, you have to stay on mute. We have controlled your mute. <laughs> um, but at the end of the story, those of you who are showing your faces, we would love to see you clapping and whooping and hollering for the storyteller. We can't hear you, but we can see you. Um, and please feel free to use the chat to show your love and support as well. We'll be able to see that to support everybody. All right, so um, let's do a practice round for the clapping and whooping and make it mean something. Um, and th those that you are hearing are the storytellers. We're gonna be cheering each other on during, during the show. So on the count of three, we're all gonna cheer and clap for the healthcare workers and the first responders and everybody going to work at the stores and restaurants and factories and distribution centers and airports and train stations, all the things that are essential that are keeping us going. Are we ready? Storytellers, okay, everybody, on the count of three. One, two, three. Woo! All right. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Thank you for that. Okay, we're ready to start. So grab a drink, a snack, get comfy, put your video on or off, up to you. Same with your pants, we don't care. <laughs> I love this audience. It's like my own private peanut gallery. I love you guys. All right, we do have six wonderful storytellers who are Braving this digital frontier. Our first up is Andrew Rogers. Andrew is a writer in Chicago by way of Portland, Oregon. Andrew has studied creative nonfiction at Story Studio and, and received a journalism degree from the University of Oregon. When he's not flacking brands or writing essays, he's probably listening to Tegan and Sarah and hanging out with his cat, who maybe will make an appearance. I don't know. Andrew, thank you for leading us off tonight. Everybody, a big cheer for Andrew. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Um, the first problem with the house on University Street was the smell, allegedly. I swear I had no idea about the smell, but everyone else did. When we moved to the house on University Street the August before senior year, the smell was all my roommates could talk about. It was constant, a complaint, a cringe, a never-ending hunt. And I thought it was really annoying. Then I, at least I think I discovered the problem with the toilet. Consider this a sub-problem of the main problem. It was subtle. One afternoon, I took a dump and it didn't flush, which at least qualifies as a sub-problem. So we called our landlord, who called a plumber, and the plumber came to our house and was like, you're your pipes burst. And he added that they'd been burst. He pointed us all towards the side yard where the alleged pipe had allegedly done been burst. 
just under our noses, we facilitated a full on shit swamp, human feces interwoven with the cracks in the concrete weeds and moss from tenants past. I was wrong about the smell. And that's how we kicked off our year at the house on University Street. We never gave the house a name, but the side yard was called the poop deck. <laughs> the house on University Street was a bad idea in retrospect, but also a bad idea in normal spec. We rented it senior year of college in Eugene, Oregon, a town so crunchy it could ship Portlandia's teeth. University Street is one of its longest thoroughfares, stretching for blocks through downtown campus and beyond. We live beyond. Campus is at 13th Street and our house was at 33rd. It was perched at the base of a hill near the neighboring community college and was almost idyllic. The only thing more idyllic perhaps being the professor's houses above us in the trees. The single level house had four bedrooms for five occupants. Me and my boyfriend Casey, our dorm friends Jackie and Jackson, high school besties, and their friend Des, who moved to College Town Eugene from small town Prineville to start anew. About a month before move-in, it became clear that Allie, Jackson's are they or aren't they partner of the summertime, would make us six. The house had so much to love. It was the cheapest place we could find, which mattered as we were all tethered to student loans and scholarships. Of note, our landlord made us pay in cash, <laughs> and it attracted wildlife. Sometimes deer chilled out in our backyard, and it even had a backyard, plus a bonus poop deck. <laughs> Inside, we counted luxuries like air conditioning, a kitchen island, and a fridge that had one of those little filtered water dispenser things. Friends almost never came over, though. They said it was too far, even though it was maybe a 10-minute bike ride from school. Joke's on you, I think. You have no idea how much money I'm saving. And I have one of those fucking water dispensers. <laughs> but problem two followed just behind the pipe. My boyfriend and I slept in the big room that faced the street, and on Sunday, mid-nap, we heard a rumbling near our window. I looked up and found the shadow of a grown man between our blinds, moving our garbage and recycling bins around, then disappearing with the biggest one. We knew what happened immediately. That guy stole our yard debris can. When the rumbling stopped, I went outside and I found our next door neighbor had two of them. So I went up to the guy in the yard and I was like, is that ours? And he was like, yeah, we left you a note. And then he was like, do you mind if we use your yard debris can? And I was like, kind of. Also, what note? I didn't find it right away because they put it in the mailbox and it was Sunday afternoon. It was written on small yellow sticky pad in this bubbly script. Hi, I'm your neighbor, Jarrell. It's like Pharrell with a J. And my husband's name is Tony. Thus began our feud with the couple next door. We lived with these two problems for a while, which escalated in severity. After the toilet pipes exploded, the bathtub flooded with like this black goopy water that came up from the drain. Then the washing machine pipe exploded. Then the ceiling above our half bathroom half collapsed. <laughs> Jarrell was annoyed about the yard debris can. We were like, dude, your husband just took it. Then everything annoyed Jarrell. On Halloween, she called the cops to our house for having a party when only Des was home. In retort, we sunbathed and drank on our roof after school, never mowed our lawn, and sometimes our cats would eat her flowers. We were not <laughs> supposed to have cats. The landlord did not know. We didn't do much about these problems because we were trying to have fun despite them. On nights in, we'd get crossfaded and make Ouija boards out of pizza boxes. We recreated scenes from Jersey Shore in the winter and took shots for Prince when he died unexpectedly that spring. And right around then, we met Aiden in Aiden's car. Aiden was Des's boyfriend from Venita, which is about an hour away. Aiden worked in our town and commuted back and forth, so him moving into the house seemed like a great idea. His commute would shorten drastically, and we'd pay even less than rent. Plus, he was a good dude. And I really mean that. Because Aiden wasn't the problem. It was his car. Imagine, like, a New Yorker cartoon caricature of toxic masculinity, but on four wheels, with, like, tricked-out rims, blaring stereo bass, and no mufflers. It made a deafening vroom. And it was fast too. Aiden only drove over 60, disregarding legal limits. I only drove with him a few times and stopped after a really questionable trip to Hobby Lobby, during which I don't even think we were going to buy anything. 
when he hit 100 <laughs> on the highway, I freaked out and I lost all interest in browsing for craft supplies. I hated the car. <laughs> Darrell and Tony weren't stoked either, but this time they organized. They arranged neighborhood-wide meetings and we'd occasionally catch the rundown from folks across the street who were snitches. We don't have a problem with you, they told us. We have a problem with the car. We sat Aiden down and made him start driving slower in the neighborhood. He complied, but the cause was already lost. The muffler was gone. He wasn't exactly going to get it back. There's no grand conclusion to my story about the house on University Street. I graduated and left almost immediately. My boyfriend and I stripped our belongings except our mattress, which we set outside on the parking strip with a little piece of paper that said free. We begin apartment living, no big yards, no hills, and seldom neighbors who, who hate your guts. Also, I read this story out loud to some people and they were like, what is a yard debris can? <laughs> I haven't lived in the house since then and went back to the university, the one on University Street only once a couple of years ago. It looked like hell. I wondered if Jarrell still lived next door and if that house still pissed her off. But sometimes it's all I can think about. Sometimes I want deer in my driveway and to smoke pot until my brain shrivels into a tiny bean. Sometimes I want to live with lots of people, too many even. And at risk of being just a little bit too on the nose after a whole month wondering if I will ever see anyone besides my roommate and my cat ever again, <laughs> I forget about everything that happened there and why I got out as soon as I could. The streets are quieter than ever now. The light revving of a car can take me by surprise. My neighbors have practically disappeared in isolation. Most importantly, the toilet always flushes and my side yard is just a side yard. I'm really not trying to weaponize my capacity for reflection right now because it seems that everything is a little shittier about life when you're in the middle of living it. Thank you. Oh, Yay. Andrew. Oh, Andrew, that was awesome. And uh, thank you for going first and sharing your poop deck with us. And um, that's a great story. You can think about my college house um, when you're in college, 4009 Pine. Um, it was such a shithole, and we loved every <laughs> every inch of it. And um, you can't go back because you go back, and you're just ashamed of ever having lived someplace like that. But um, but that's great. You brought me back, and I'm sure a lot of people. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Well done. All right. Next up, we have the lovely Callie Hack. Thanks. A freelance writer and copywriter. Her articles can be found in Reductress, The Takeout, Allure, Good Housekeeping, and Women's Health, among others. She is, now this is going to sound like a personal ad. She's a Leo who loves a lot of things. <laughs> a really good high five and guessing up front. And is scared of even more things like city drivers with strong emotions and well, everything else in the world. Please welcome Callie to the literal spotlight. Callie! Yay! 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 Hi, thank you for having me. Well, okay. So I was 15 in biology class when I started getting these hot flashes and then waves of cold chills and my mouth starts salivating this thick copper taste in the back of my mouth. And I ran to the girl's bathroom and I just start dry heaving and vomiting up bile. And then I got my period, like a beautiful coming of age story for any girl. And this is what set the tone for what my body would do to me month after month for the next 17 years. So I went from missing school to missing work. I saw doctors and I would tell them about the pain and I would explain how horrible it was to be in my body during my period. And they would usually just like nod along and they would say, well, some women have it worse than others. And they would offer me birth control, but like no real answers. And then they would just pat me on the knee and they'll be like, we'll see you in another six to 12 months. So I just thought this was my lot in life. It wasn't until about two years ago where I had like one of the worst episodes yet, where I was sleeping over at my then boyfriend's house. And when I woke up early in the morning, 
my body was so bloated and the cramps were becoming unbearable. So I shifted from side to side trying to get any sort of relief, but it was like worthless. Like I knew what I was in for. So I made my way to the bathroom to start running a hot bath. But before I could get in, the salivating started and I was getting dizzy and my vision was getting blurry and I knelt in front of the toilet and started dry heaving until I blacked out and hit my head on the bathroom tile. I started convulsing oh. so hard and hit my head and it left a goose egg on my left temple. Later, a neurologist would tell me I dry heaved so much I had asphyxiated myself, but not in like the cute consensual like kinky way that how we all imagine our first asphyxiation would be. It was like <laughs> in a very different way that was not fun at all. <laughs> When I came to, I crawled back in bed and I just like waited for the next round to hit me. So I was at a breaking point and I didn't want to be in my body any longer every month that this was going to happen. So I went to see another doctor, Dr. Megan Sheldon. And I explained to Dr. Sheldon the pain that I was going through each month. And she said something to me no other doctor had said before. She said, that sounds terrible. And my heart like melted. Like there's this doctor who's actually taking my pain seriously. And then she said, we can figure this out. And it was like the heavens opened up and like a beam of light shone down. And I was like, God, I don't think I have to continue living this way every month. And then she goes, I think it might be a combination of syphilis and gonorrhea. <laughs> <laughs> And I just like quickly went through like the sexual Rolodex in my head, like thinking about like who I needed to call, whose number I don't have anymore. But then she was like, but it could also be endometriosis. So I was like, okay. She's like, we're going to have to do a couple tests. We'll do some tests and an ultrasound. So we did the test, no syphilis, no gonorrhea, no combination thereof, but also no endometriosis. But the ultrasound did show something else. She called, she said, we found a large mass in your right ovary. She went on to explain that what I had was called a teratoma, which tra translates in Greek to little monster. And I was like, oh my God, all my exes were right. I do have a little monster inside of me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what a teratoma is. A teratoma is a type of tumor that grows like hair and teeth and fat cells, sometimes bones or organs, nerve endings. And then she said to me, she said, there's, this is no Clementine cutie you have in there. Like this is a full size Florida orange in your ovary. She's like, it's imperative that we get it out in the next three months, or it has the possibility to weigh down your ovary, which would cause your fallopian tube to twist in on itself, cutting off blood supply and oxygen and rendering organ failure. And then so she was like, check your calendar, see when's best for you. But she's <laughs> like, I, I am moving to Denver. And I was like, oh my God, this dermoid tumor is gonna be so expensive for me. Like, could I afford to fly to Denver? Should I file, like follow my gynecologist across the country? <laughs> Women follow their boyfriends all the time. I don't know why I couldn't do it for a doctor who started believing in me. <laughs> so this is when the terror started setting in though. Like the relief of having an answer that something was wrong with me was great, but it was short lived because then there was an, the anxiety of having this little monster that had made a home in my body. My anxiety is worse to me than my own body. So I started to convince myself that during surgery, I was going to die. And I had like a good support system of friends and family, but I had no partner at the time. And I was like, oh, this is why people get married. This is why people couple up because when you know you're gonna die, it's like, the loneliest feeling to go to bed with your weighted blanket. <laughs> <laughs> After I convinced myself that, okay, I'm not gonna die, these are smart doctors. But then I convinced myself that if during surgery they would have to remove all of my organs and then no man would love me without a uterus and ovaries. And if I couldn't have a child, then I was worthless to love. And I had no idea that I had like this internalized misogyny inside of me, but it was dark and it like killed my self-worth. But I talked to some male friends and they're like, oh my God, no, it's not like not having ovaries and a uterus. Like it's your personality keeping you back. <laughs> <laughs> so I did what 
what any lonely person would do. And I reached out to my exes during this time because reaching out to somebody who has already told you they no longer want to be in your life is definitely the way to feel less alone. So I was like, just be casual. I'll just send out like a real feeler text and I'll be like, hey, hey, humor. <laughs> and then just like watch the sparks fly. Um, I just thought it was polite of me to let them know just in case I did die. Then I mean they'll be getting the grieving process up front. It was only it was only right. <laughs> um, one of my exes was very concerned and was super sweet. And we went out to dinner together and talked and it was wonderful until he told me that he had just proposed to the girl he was seeing. And then he followed it up with like, that we could just see each other on the side still. And I was like, oh, I can't. I just told my therapist I wouldn't be seeing men who are already in relationships. <laughs> so I cut that one off. <laughs> but then I scheduled my surgery in January. And when the day came and the surgery takes place, it took longer than expected. The tumor was bigger than what they first thought. I survived and I woke up and my mom was by my side and I immediately started crying from the pain and she squeezed my hand and she was like, oh, sweet pea. That anesthesiologist was like very cute. You should consider <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is probably the only man that could drug me and roll my naked body to a second location and my mom would be like, he seems nice. <laughs> material. <laughs> so it's been a couple of years now and everything is fine. The pain from the teratoma is long gone. And while I like currently am not in a partnership, I am also not dealing with as many monsters. Thank you guys. Yeah. Oh, Kelly. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kelly, I just keep picturing your little monster, I have to tell you. <laughs> I don't want to be picturing your little monster, but um, wow, that, that was a heck of a story and um, got some good laughs in there too. I know it was amazing. Thank you so much. And um, I'm glad you're, you're feeling so good. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Denise McIntosh. Denise has lived in Chicago for 39 years and has been writing and delivering stories with Generations, the Goodman Theater Storytelling Program for people five and better. And she's 55. 55, listen to me. Thank you, Denise. 55 <laughs> are all five and better, but 55 and better is like amazing. 55 and better. For, uh, she's been doing that for two years. Um, Denise takes guilty pleasure in long road trips, but cycles as much as possible in Chicago and is very thankful for the flatness of Illinois. And when she's not helping clients to declutter, she's often on the dance floor where she has completed, competed in ballroom, Latin, hustle, and West Coast swing. Please everybody, let's give a big warm welcome for Denise. Thank you, Susie. Thanks everyone for being here. So here's a cosmic twist between my parents. They were married for 24 years to the minute. True story. They were married in a small chapel in Bozeman, Montana on June 24th, 1956 at 3 p.m. Their last court appearance to finalize their divorce was June 24th, 1976 at 3 p.m. 20 years <laughs> to the minute. And in another burst of kismet, my mother died on my father's birthday. The divorce had stretched longer than the marriage, 27 years, but through it all, they'd remained friends. And so I had to call my dad, who was visiting friends in Texas, to say, happy birthday, Papa Bear. How's Texas? And though, by the way, your ex-wife just died, that wasn't exactly how my side of the conversation went, but I'm blurry on the details. I'm sure I blubbered more. I'm sure I wasn't the least sarcastic, but that was the gist. I'd rushed from Chicago to the hospital in Kansas City 
when mother landed in the ICU. I was still standing in the ICU, standing next to mother's jaundiced corpse, trying desperately not to look at the bed, hugging the phone to my ear. The nurses had all vanished. Papa Bear and I didn't talk long, but before we hung up, he promised to fly to Kansas City, where I was, where my mother had lived out the last decade of her life as soon as he could make flight arrangements. Thank Jesus and all the holy fishes, he came up to help me. He knew what to do, who to call, where to go, what to plan, all the logistical details of sudden importance when a person dies, details of which I had been blithely ignorant. Planning a funeral was near the top of the list. Turns out that planning a funeral is a lot like planning a wedding, except you have only about three days instead of an entire year. You need at least one venue, maybe two, flowers, a minister, music, a guest list, and a big meal after the main event. Except somehow I knew we weren't going to be doing a normal funeral. I knew we were going to do a concert. Not with live musicians, because that would require a full orchestra, an outstanding concert pianist, several Met quality soloists, an outstanding chorus, but we have the next best thing, recordings. Mother held bachelor's and master's degrees in music and had a career teaching music in elementary schools. She performed with the Rackham Choir, accompanied the Great Lakes Steel Mail Chorus, taught piano lessons, and directed the church choir. I was conscripted into her adult choir at age 10. She lived a very musical life. I never asked my dad if he'd expected to plan his ex-wife's funeral. We just did it together, like so many other things that we'd organized. Papa Bear and I made a list of mother's favorite music, all classical, of course. This was pre-digital. Mother's entire collection was on LP records, but LPs would be too unwieldy to play at the memorial. We needed CDs. So we went shopping, traipsing from store to store in the rain until we found enough music to do her justice. Back at the house, we organized the concert and typed up the program. Mother's move to Kansas City was the direct result of her joining an extremely conservative religious group. Holy Roller, she was not, but the idea of the end times and the latter days had long captured her imagination, her retirement years, and her pocketbook. I understood to what degree only after she died. When I discovered a tightly loaded backpack in her garage, complete with gas mask, emergency medical supplies, and survivalist food rations. When I unzipped the top, however, the first thing that came to hand was a compact Bible. She was a complex mix of faith and fear. I wasn't about to let my mother's congregation of patriarchal survivalists dictate any part of her memorial service. So my dad and I found a large chapel in the funeral home and spread word of the service, including to her many church friends. The memorial we designed was simple. The crowd, and it was a crowd, sat in silence for a few minutes, reading an essay I'd written about my mom. And then the music began. Mozart, Mendelssohn, Beethoven, Handel, Brahms, pieces that she had loved soared into the sad and expectant air, one after the other, until the last note of the last song died away. My Uncle Ted stood and offered a benediction. 
and that was it. Since mother's body had been delivered to the science lab straight from the hospital, all we had to do was pack up the flowers, collect the CDs, and go back to the house to eat. Her congregation had volunteered to bring over a potluck supper. I didn't appreciate their religious views, but I couldn't turn down their fried chicken. I inadvertently discovered later that her congregation was so upset at what they considered to be a blasphemous travesty of a memorial that they gave her a second row later that month. I wasn't invited. Mother never spoke to me about her funeral. Papa Bear didn't know anything, and I didn't have one damn document to tell me what her wishes might be. Her estate papers, which I'd never seen, were not to be found in her meticulously organized office. They did turn up weeks after the memorial. And heaven help me, but the cliche came to life. They were under her mattress. <laughs> and I was stunned to read the following clause. The grantor directs that in place of a memorial service for her, she desires that a musical concert be held and that she not be mentioned at such concert. Somehow, after her death, my mother communicated to me her desire to be remembered with music and only music. A grand concert of her favorites was just what she wanted. And that's what she got. Kyrie eleison, hallelujah, and amen. Thank you. Denise, thank you so much. We can do better than that peanut gallery. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ooh. Ooh. Thank you so much. Um, how it's a it's a beautiful story and beautifully told. And um, to know your mother's heart like the way you did. Is so thank you for sharing that with us. All right, this we are three down, three to go. I just want you all to know that we are seeing your comments and your chats on the side here and um, it's lovely. So storytellers, if you haven't taken a look yet, take a look, you got some really awesome shout outs because you guys are killing it. So thank you for that. Thank you, audience. You're so quiet. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, we normally take a break at O'Shaughnessy's and we tell you to order another drink and be sure to take care of your serving staff, but um, moving on. Okay, here we go. Next up is Ines Felina, one of the founding members and original producers of Is This a Thing? She's a writer and a coach and a consultant and she teaches storytelling classes at Story Studio which is where we producers all met at, as classmates over seven years ago. Ines is from Peru, but she is a true citizen of the world. So everybody, a nice, warm welcome. Please welcome our dear friend, Ines. Thanks so much to everyone for being here. All right. Ah. I didn't know much about Andreas other than he was German, he was married to my sister, and I would be meeting him for the first time over the holidays. The reason I had yet to meet my sister's husband was more mundane than scandalous. It wasn't an indication of any irreparable tear in our relationship, but just a result of having my family scattered all over the world. He may, my sister, had met him in our home country of Peru, a place I had pretty much abandoned at age 20. My sister had then traveled a few times to Europe to see him. She secured a student visa along the way, and using the power of that document, she moved into his home and never left. Their elopement was the worst kept secret in our family circle. Through no fault other than my sister's own inability to keep any secrets. For months, she had posted a series of horoscopes and astrological memes indicating commitment with vague booking captions like, oh my God, I was just thinking about eternal commitment today. <laughs> <laughs> my parents, long for 
worried about the outdated question of what young man would take care of my sister could care less how it happened. They were just happy that it had happened. My sister was married to someone and that was enough for them to rejoice. Now, Hime had long dreamed of getting married and having children one day, preferably as far away from Peru as humanly possible. So of course I was very happy that two out of her three dreams had come true. On the other hand, I was curious about this new man that was about to enter our lives, and I was perplexed when the only answers I got from my sister about Andreas was that he was very kind, and he was very caring, and he was very, very German. My parents, who live in Sweden, were able to satisfy their own curiosity a few months later, and their assessment was eerily similar. What does very, very German even mean? I asked Hime. From my understanding, it was something very different to a Berliner, which apparently was in a category all of its own, comprised of ambient techno and like homoerotic smurf art and some sort of like <laughs> mini world. <laughs> Andrea, being from a tiny town in North Rhine, Westphalia, was really far removed from that reality. My sister answered cryptically. You'll know it when you see it. Now, before we even move on, I would like to publicly state that I'm sure hashtag not all Germans approach life this way. But I can also honestly say <laughs> that I've rarely seen the soon to be described interactions I had with him during our Christmas trip to Stockholm in citizens of any other country. And I've lived in dozens of cities around the world and visited over 40 nations. And yes, that was a humble brag, but don't worry, I'm being punished just like the rest of you during this quarantine. <laughs> I had a suspicion, though, that this is what my sister meant when she said that he was very, very German. So interaction number one during Christmas vacation in Sweden. When I asked Andreas if he had enjoyed our visit to the National Museum of Art, he answered matter-of-factly that he couldn't give me an honest assessment because he had only visited two out of the four floors in said museum and therefore his opinion would be based on partial information and was inconclusive. Interaction number two. <laughs> Andreas's favorite activity was comparing every single sightseeing excursion we partook in Stockholm to a similar sightseeing excursion he had done in Riga, the capital of Latvia. Now Riga almost always won in comparison. He clearly had enjoyed his trip to Riga. As far as I could tell, nothing could ever live up to the magic of Riga, given that he <laughs> read the topic every hour on the hour and usually with a smile of <clears throat> approval. Now, because I too can be an absolute nightmare, and because amazing is a passage of right in my family, I asked him pointedly what his favorite travel destination had been after Riga was uttered yet again. And inside, I kept chanting, Riga, 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 say Riga. <laughs> But the bastard didn't even give me the satisfaction. He said all his trips had been both enjoyable, though disappointing in their own ways, turning himself into the Tolstoy of mindless chatter. <laughs> Interaction number three. We made the terrible mistake of taking him to one of those free city walking tours. Now the guide was like A+. Plus. The guide was not the problem. The problem was that Andreas, during the Q&A section at the end of the tour, wanted to ask why they promoted themselves as a free walking tour if they would finish the day asking for tips as courtesy. Now, I had no doubt in my mind that Andreas was very kind and very caring, and he clearly loved my sister very much. He was also impossible to have an easygoing banter with, and it was slowly seeping all my social energy out. I wouldn't go as far as to say he had no sense of humor. It popped up every now and then in what can only be described as dad jokes. Germanic, translated into English, dad jokes. And I would laugh along because my mom raised me with good, good etiquette and also in the hopes that he would one day return the favor. But Andreas was a man of integrity and he was not going to laugh at my jokes simply to be nice. And every single one of my attempts at banter or joking or teasing died as soon as it reached his very literally inclined brain. <laughs> now, as a festive end to the holiday season, my parents had planned a weekend trip to Estonia, 
a destination so intriguing, the New York Times published an article about it with the title, and I quote, in praise of a normal, boring country. (laughs) 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 Family's very own Everest, a journey we were embarking on simply because it was there. We were going to set sail on an overnight booze cruise across the Baltic Sea, arrive in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia in the morning, and then spend a day touring the historic capital, looking for a local dish that my dad would be willing to eat. So I'm the kind of person who is happy to go anywhere for any reason and through any means. When my mom told me that the Swedes loved these travel quickies because duty-free alcohol was a benefit their generous government was unwilling to provide, I was very much aware that we were not about to set sail on one of those like lavish experiences you see before Downton Abbey airs on PBS. The ship was clean and functioning, but it had an aesthetic that was like Iron Curtain meets a down on its luck Reno Gentleman's Club. and a sit-down restaurant and like a couple of arcades and a balcony where you could shiver your hiney off as you looked at the sky. (laughs) <laughs> the whole point of entertainment, though, that night was, like, this dance floor in their two-story casino. Now, I could not tell you if there were blackjack tables open or roulette spinning because my entire family was too mesmerized by the scenario unfolding on its stage. Before us was a live band doing their damn best to get the party started by blasting every single top 40 Latin hit of the past decade. Despite us being at least one continent and multiple seas away from the region. (laughs) The woman singer did have quite the lovely voice, but I was too distracted by her male counterpart, a muscular man whose luscious chest hair spilled over the opening of his blue white blouse. (laughs) Despacito, in a catchy and inflected tone, the man would every once in a while break out in flamenco dance moves. Even though reggaeton is a completely separate genre, but no matter, we were in international waters and no (laughs) As we downed one sugary cocktail after the next, I saw my family descending further and further into a terrifying hypnotic state, all the way down to the very first floor so they could be closer to the stage. Children were twirling in circles with the energy of feral animals. Atlanta was busy getting the conga line started, but we made the terrible mistake of making eye contact with him. And soon St. Nicholas was waving his arms with great enthusiasm right behind my sister, who followed the direction to express every single glance of glee she had for dance. My mom, a lady who fears scandal so much she has yet to stray from her collection of off-white sweaters, clapped her way into a dance circle with my dad in tow. We have lost them both. A set of maracas appeared out of nowhere. The strobe lights were moving my retinas in ways I doubt even the most powerful hallucinogenic ever could. The Swedes were like too tall, like too freakishly tall. The shrieks of glee were too warbled. I had lost sense of direction, time, place, and even taste because I was starting to see the paisley carpet on the floor is kind of chic. And it was all disorienting and preternatural and the blurring of what I understood to be real or not. This is my David Lynch nightmare. I finally (laughs) blurred out to Andreas. (laughs) And then something even more unprecedented happened. Out of the very bowels of Andreas came a rip roaring, belly aching, thunderous laugh. A laugh, a real laugh, not an etiquette laugh or a giggle or a chuckle but the kind of like instinctive expression that rises up when something truly hits your heart. And at last I thought, we have reached a whole new level in our relationship. This can be the foundation upon which our friendship grows. And it was, at least until the next day when he promptly asked me to explain exactly what part of David Lynch's work I was referring to when I said David Lynch nightmare. Thank you. Oh my god. Okay, you guys cool things. One, I want to party with your family. Like as soon as this thing is over, just tell me where they are. Right? Party at Inessa. Two, um, I believe 
Jake has started and it's already trending. Hashtag not all Germans. So, um, <laughs> and three, um, you got to check out some of the comments. Super, super Thank fun. You. So, another big hand for Ines. Thank you. Thank Yay. you. Okay. All right. Uh, next up. All right. How's everyone doing? I'm going to do gallery view real quick. Oh, gosh, so many of you are not showing your faces. Oh, I see lots of faces. Can I see like a thumbs up or a hey? Katie, I see you. I see all you guys. All right. Awesome. Okay, that was just fun for me. Back to my notes. All right, Isaiah Newman is next up, and he is a brand new storyteller who has come to Chicago by way of New York. He works as an early childhood educator by day, writing fiction by night. He loves cooking and baking and has been using his social distancing to perfect his bagel recipe. And if you talk to him about Carly Rae Jepsen, chances are you'll make him very happy. Isaiah, please share your bagel recipe with us in the chat when you are finished. And in the meantime, everybody, a nice warm welcome for Isaiah. Woo! Yay! Yay! Ooh, thank you. Okay. On April 17th, in four days, I will turn 24. And for the first time, I will not be in the same place as my twin brother when it happens. He lives in Berkeley, California, but he and his girlfriend bought one-way tickets to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, when it first started to seem like this might get bad, like this virus might stick around for a little while. We haven't always celebrated our birthday with each other or even in the same way. I've always felt like I'm the one to make a bigger deal out of it. And once we hit high school, we never had the same social circles anyway. I like meals with friends, cakes, the usual. He doesn't mind these things, but doesn't seem to go out of his way for them. This year, of course, none of that will be happening. No potlucks, no long tables at cheap restaurants, no candles. But none of that really stings to me as much as the father as much as the fact that my brother will be gone while it's happening, that we probably won't share a birthday together for a long time. This would have been true anyway, virus or no virus. He moved to the Bay Area for work last June and I'm still, well, in Chicago. But the isolation adds to the feeling. Once upon a time, I wouldn't have minded so much. I would have been happy to be separate, to spend weeks, months, even years apart. In seventh grade, once, our parents went to a party at a neighbor's. We were 12, so they thought we were old enough to be left alone. Uh, I can't remember exactly how the fight started, but I do remember throwing one of our older brother's textbooks at his head after he made fun of me. And I remember him running out of the room and hiding until our parents got home. Don't worry, the textbook didn't hit him. I remember getting into a slap fight on our way to Hebrew school one Monday afternoon in sixth grade, dropping our after school snacks on the sidewalk, and then being separated and told to walk several feet apart for the rest of the way there. Social distancing came naturally to us, it turns out. And I also remember him yelling at me over something I'd said to another kid in our grade over AOL Instant Messenger, some piece of middle school gossip I'd accidentally let slip when I shouldn't have how mad he was with me for messing with social dynamics I didn't understand. I always felt like I was a little worse off in our preteen social hierarchy. He played sports, was good at them, understood them. And so I decided I just wouldn't bother with them. He was the popular one, I told myself, the one who got it. So why bother? But of course, there are other memories too that complicate these things. I remember him crying next to the linen closet at the back of our family's apartment sometime near the end of sixth grade, crushed under the weight of the social pressure he felt to conform and to fit in with my parents comforting him. I remember being ushered away quickly to give him space. I also remember sitting outside at a bar mitzvah for one of his friends a year later. We were invited to everything together because we were twins. And I was crying because I felt like no one wanted me to sit with them and I didn't know what to do. And then he came and found me and sat with me, talked to me. 
Crying comes easily in our family, thankfully, so he wasn't too put off. And I remember also when we both started therapy with different therapists, of course, <laughs> and how things calmed down and the tension released. And then in high school, we started watching cartoons together. We cooked together. We stayed up late listening to music together. There's a picture of us from the summer after junior year taken during a family vacation. The two of us are standing next to each other on the beach, arms around each other and facing toward the camera. Both of us are barefoot and we're smiling, real, genuine smiles, not forced. The strongest memory of all though, for me, comes from senior year. We'd both gotten into college, the same college, and had decided to go together. We were in the living room late at night on a weekday. I was reading, he was watching TV. He turned off the TV, he's always gone to bed before me, walked toward the bathroom to brush his teeth for bed. But before he did, he turned around. Hey, Zoo, he said. That's his nickname for me, which comes from not being able to pronounce Isaiah when we were little. Yeah, I said. I'm glad we're going to college together, he told me. Oh. And even though we didn't throw birthday parties together while there, it still hits hard now that he won't even be nearby when our birthday rolls around. And that even if he were, all I would be able to do is wave from six feet away. I love him very much, and I hope, wish he were here. Aww. Thank you. Aww. Um, I'm tempted to sing you happy birthday, but we all know what singing on Zoom is like. Oh my God, I don't know how happy birthday. Don't do it, don't do it. So no singing, but happy, happy birthday, Isaiah. We will be thinking about you. Um, beautiful story. And um, I would remiss not to mention that both Isaiah and Andrew are Ines's students from her last class at Story Studio. So snaps for Yay. that. Well done, teacher. Well done. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so, which leads me to, um, first of all, I want to say there are, um, there are 60 people. Oh, yeah, we have to go close to 60 people with us tonight, which is really amazing. I don't think we can fit 60 at O'Shaughnessy's, so this is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> and there might be a lot of people here who are sort of seeing the show for the first time, who are either, you know, in Chicago, have never made it to our show, or maybe joining us from wherever you are. And so we do this show every month, the second Monday of the month at O'Shaughnessy's, which is this fabulous Irish pub, we're in the back room, the food is great, the drinks are great. We've been doing this for seven years. Um, we have a lot of regulars and then we got a lot of people who show up for the first time because we're there to support a storyteller and, um, and then they might become regulars themselves. And it's been this lovely community. Chicago has an amazing storytelling and live lit community and we're a part of it and we're very honored and privileged to, to do that. And every show we tell people, hey, you just heard all these storytellers. Think you can do it? Of course you can. And so let us know, get in touch. You all have stories in you and, um, and we're here for you. And, um, and that's still, I don't know how long we'll, have, we'll be doing the Zoom thing. Maybe we'll do it in May and maybe June we'll all be together. I don't know, I'm not saying anything, but, um, but coming together and telling stories is what it's all about, no matter how we do it. So please check us out on, is, at, find us on, is this a thing on Facebook? Is this the thing on Facebook with the question mark? And um, follow us, chat with us, let us know if you're interested and thank you for your support tonight. All right, uh, we are down to our last lovely, wonderful storyteller of the night. Um, I'm very excited that Joy Wright is with us. She is a Best of the Net nominated writer, storyteller, social justice activist, nonprofit fundraiser, and single queer mom. Joy's publications include Huffington Post, Entropy Magazine, and a column on dating at rebelliousmagazine.com. A longer version of the piece that she's sharing with us tonight was published in December in the Huffington Post Personal, and it ran worldwide, it was even translated into French in France. Um, I'm hoping she's sharing her story with us in English. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Please welcome 
joy bright. Yay, joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out or I guess staying in is what I mean, but for joining <laughs> us. Um, most people heading in for a late night Whopper at the Kankakee Burger King might have been shocked to know that a woman was meeting her sperm donor inside the restaurant. But there I was outside the men's room waiting for a paper cup full of semen. I would do anything for a baby of my own even pick up free food at a fast food chain. I'd wanted a baby since I was a little girl with a baby doll that I took everywhere, knowing that one day she would be real and hoping that day would be soon. But there I was, 34, single, lesbian, and feeling desperate. In the beginning, I'd gone the frozen sperm route. Each month, on the day I was ovulating, I'd drive across town collect this precious fluid in its metal shipping container that was half my height, full of dry eyes and looked like something right out of the Jetsons. Once <laughs> home from the clinic, I'd open this tube and the vapors would come pouring over the lip and rising above my hands. And I'd slowly lift out one of two tiny vials of sperm. I'd inseminate with a needless syringe, just like they showed me to at the clinic two days in a row, and then I'd return the giant capsule. This went on for months. But do you know how expensive frozen sperm is? Mm -hmm. My closest friend and confidant, Roy Ann, a feisty redhead who's like a sister to me, threw me a big sperm party. Not a party where people brought sperm, which might have been a great <laughs> idea, but a fundraiser <laughs> to buy the stuff. Still, I quickly ran out of savings. Sperm was everywhere. I just couldn't get my hands or other parts on any of it. <laughs> what I needed was a man, a donor, someone, some free sperm that brought with it no drama, no commitment, and definitely no sex. One Saturday in the midst of this process, I went to a visiting, uh, visioning workshop with my friend, Orianne. We wrote goals and meditated and focused on creating the life that we believed in. I was on that journey, but I was stuck. The leader insisted there is no stuck. How about money for sperm, I thought, but she didn't address that. Late in the morning, we formed pairs looking deeply into each other's eyes while we mirrored each other's movements. My partner was a complete stranger, yet I found this um, profound connection to him. As we went to lunch, he sat down next to me and the energy was just radiating between us. As the group chatted, I told my story, coming to my current state, which was not pregnant and out of money for sperm. This lovely man, Drake, said, why don't you just find a donor? I turned to him, got all shaky, and dumped my entire glass of lemonade in his lap. <laughs> Grabbing napkins and leaning forward, I had to stop myself just before rubbing his crotch. <laughs> Everybody laughed, but I couldn't <laughs> help thinking about this man's private parts covered in my lemonade. <laughs> Next day, Drake called and offered to be my donor. Drake and his wife had not wanted children, and yet Drake felt this loss at not passing on his, his genes. He was tall, gentle, and brilliant. He was perfect. The only problem was Drake lived in normal Illinois, and I lived in Chicago. That's a two and a half hour drive when there's no traffic. There's always traffic. The first time we inseminated, Drake and his wife invited me to their home where we had dinner, wine, and a good conversation. I brought a date. It's not a typical date for casually dating lesbians to spend their time, but she was game. After dinner, we got down to business. Shortly after I headed to my room, Drake, Drake arrived with a coffee, coffee cup full of semen. I inseminated in a room full of windows looking out onto the woods. 
During the night, deer came up and they ate corn left out for them under the windows in the moonlight. It was completely magical, but I didn't get pregnant. And we just couldn't do that every month. When you're ovulating, you are ovulating and you have to have sperm that very day and the next day. It's one thing when getting that sperm is a lot of fun, but when you've got to drive two and a half hours each way and you figure it out early in the morning by taking your temperature and peeing on a stick, it is not easy. The next time I ovulated was on a Tuesday. On Wednesday morning, I had to be to work before 7 a.m. to set up a training for 50 people. My little Honda Civic hatchback was jam-packed full of training manuals, name tags, and an easel with paper. The back was full, but there was room up front for two seats, two people, and my sister friend, Royan offered to go with me. I called Drake as soon as I knew I was ovulating. He said, forget that trip downstate. Just meet me at the Burger King in Kankakee. You know that exit, Kankakee? Or maybe it's Dwight, it's near the men's prison. It's the only gas station and food for miles. This plan cut my trip in half. Oh. We pulled up and Drake was already there getting his gas. He was cordial, but direct. He said, hey, it's good to see you. I'm in a bit of a hurry. I'm gonna go in the restroom with this paper cup. Meet me there. As he headed into the restroom or into the Burger King, he handed me a jar of honey from the beehive that he kept. Inside the Burger King, I tried to look casual as I waited outside the men's room. Cordially and coolly, without the least bit of awkwardness, Drake handed me the Burger King cup full of semen. Smiled and headed on out the door. Looking around first, I took the paper cup into the women's room and used my handy little syringe to inseminate. Now I couldn't let all that stuff just leak out, especially after this wonderful man drove all that way to create it for me in a Burger King restroom, and I didn't even buy him dinner. Fertility <laughs> books recommend that a woman trying to get pregnant lay back with her hips up on a pillow, allowing gravity to assist. Unfortunately, I didn't have any comfy pillows and my back seat was full of training supplies. But with Royan as the driver, I adjusted my passenger seat, pushed it all the way back as far as it would go, and I got in backwards with my head heading down where my feet should go and my feet sticking straight up in the air, waiting for nature to do its thing. When we got back to Chicago, we stopped at this little spot on the Chicago River. I read in an old witch's almanac that if you put honey from the man you are trying to get pregnant with on a pumpkin and you throw it in the river, it will seal the deal. The moon reflected on the water as I threw that pumpkin, speaking words of my intention. Telling you I got pregnant that night would be the Hollywood ending to this story, but I didn't. Nor did I on the next trip to Burger King or the one after that. In fact, I never got pregnant. Instead, my path led me on a completely different journey. My casual dating relationship became committed, my partner committing not just to me, but to the process of adoption as well. Mm. Two years later, a beautiful infant boy became ours, mm. his feisty toddler sister joining us just two and a half years after that. Oh. I became a mom in a two-mom family, and my closest friend, Roy Ann, who stuck with me through it all, became Auntie Roy. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Oh, that was awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Joy. Um, that was amazing. I can't wait to read the French version. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the best first line ever. What was it? I got inseminated at a Burger King? Is that... Most people heading in for a late night Whopper in the King oh. Kiki Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> I love the casual. I waited, ca tried to look casual. 
that's a thing at Burger King. That that's awesome. I I told you when I first heard your story that um wow I told an insemination story not too long ago. You and I should take this on the road. I think. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> All right. Well, um oh you guys, my wine is finished. The storytellers are finished. The Zoom could keep going. We can all hang out. Um, <laughs> but I, I have a feeling most of you have spent most of the day on Zoom. And I can't thank you enough, all you wonderful storytellers. First of all, okay, we're going to give ourselves a big hand. But all of you, we can see you. So please join us. A big round of applause, storytellers included, for our beautiful six storytellers. <laughs> Damien, behind the scenes, you are awesome. Yay! Yay! You kept us heard Yay. in the scene. That is not a small thing. Jake, you got this lineup together. You rock, as always. Um, we will let you know what happens in May. If we can pull this off again, we'd love to see you all. Um, and there'll be information about that. So is this the thing on Facebook is the way to find us and stay in touch? Let us know how this worked, because um, y'all look OK. Um, I think I saw one person fall asleep, but other than that, I think <laughs> you guys get home safe. No, um, no drinking, driving on the road anymore for a while, which is good. Um, we love you all. Thank you. Here's to stories and, and the people who tell them and stay safe, stay well. And um, just, uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you guys very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.